A strange liquor with a reputation about as big as the bean has been bringing Chicagoans together for nearly a century by washing the pretense off of any tourists that encounter it. I heard someone once call it the whoopee cushion of booze. More often than not, those having it for the first time share a squeamish face right after their inaugural shot, but it's almost like a badge of honor for those brave enough to partake. It's malort, literally translated from its native Sweden, moth herb, and its bitter taste is seen as shocking, abrasive, or downright nasty. But if what Davy Jones from the Monkees once said is true, that there's an audience for everything, that means that even the most questionable of products, like Malort, should be, at the very least, marketable. Hey Marlene, how are you? Good, how are you, Jim? Awesome. Thank you so much for wanting to do this. I appreciate it. I wanted to test this theory with someone in the advertising world and reached out to Marlene Sharp. She's out of Los Angeles and she's done social media outreach and other work for big alcohol brands like Garrison Brothers Distillery and Boone's Bourbon. So her resume comes in handy because I wondered, do we live in a world where Malort is just flat out unmarketable? I didn't tell Marlene we were talking about Malort at first. I simply wanted to drop a few descriptors and get her honest hot takes. The origin of it goes back maybe as far as the Middle Ages. It's a U.S. kind of like unofficial headquarters or so is here in the Chicago area. This is not a scientific number, but in the research and interviews that we've done so far, a very high percentage of people who have this product only have it once and never have it again. But yet in Chicago, it's estimated that there are 15,000 shots of alcohol served any particular night. And this product is absolutely one of them. We put out a question on social media. How would you describe the taste of this product? These are some responses. Um, one person's response was, it tastes like Listerine gone bad. One person described it as tasting like pencil shavings. Another said, <laughs> expired grapefruit juice that's been strained through a dirty gym sock. And maybe my favorite one is somebody described it as simply regret. This product has survived a very long time for more than 90 years in the U.S. So hearing all this, I mean, tell me your first reactions as somebody in, in your line of work. Well, it almost sounds like the kind of thing that maybe college frats would get into, like daring each other. The taste seems to be a problem. So <laughs> we, we're we would want to market it for its taste because I don't know that um, Listerine and pencil shavings and certainly not regret are not tastes that people are going for these days. Probably trying to, to get away from those things. If something tastes bad, then it it makes you feel good. Or if, if it tastes good, uh, maybe it's got a lot of calories or it, 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 there's got to be something good about it. So what is good about Malort? Or better yet, what is so intrinsically Chicago about it? What is its deeper history, both overseas and locally? And why do we keep punishing ourselves with this hazing ritual in a shot glass? I'm Jim Hankey, and today we are bellying up to the bar to learn more about Malort. Unlikely hero, or just unlikable? Let's get looped in, Chicago. Before we get into Malort's history, let's just approach this storied liquor like many of us have originally, by not knowing much and just diving right in. And in Chicago, that dive, pun intended, is Nisei Lounge in Wrigleyville, which even on its website flaunts itself as Chicago's finest dive bar. But it also has a rich backstory. Nisei was opened over 70 years ago by second-generation Japanese immigrants. In fact, Nisei literally translates to second generation and their logo pays homage to Japan's flag of the sun. Then, much like now, according to bartender and director of Malort Infusions, Val Capone, Nisei has been a respite for those seeking a safe place to drink and commiserate. And one of the things I love about this bar is that it was, and it always has been, and I, especially now, we still keep it a safe space for everyone because, um, unfortunately, during World War II, Americans were not so kind towards our fellow citizens 
that were Japanese American. It's just so gross to think that American citizens were treated so poorly that the windows of this bar had to be blacked out so they could feel safe with their families to just be here and just be together. And one of the reasons why I love working at this bar is because it has always been a safe space. So it doesn't matter your skin color, your gender identity, your religion or lack thereof. None of that crap matters and it never should. I don't think so. And I don't think anybody that works here thinks so. Nisei's decor is outfitted with red paint on the walls to complement the abundance of holiday garland dangling from above. Little snowmen, reindeer, snowflakes, and other festive friends populate to mask the dark ceiling, and it lightens the mood. And that vibe feels right for Val, who bills herself as, quote, a facilitator of fun. People always ask me what I do for a living because I do work in multiple locations, such as Wrigley Field and here at Nisei Lounge. I recently started at G-Man Tavern. Um, I also work in professional wrestling as a ring announcer, commentator, and backstage interviewer. Um, I work at music venues and music festivals, so it seems like I have a lot of jobs. And so I just like making people happy, and if it means getting weird with some artichokes and in, inside a bottle of Malort, well, let's get weird. The taste of Malort doesn't go down or come out of your mouth easy. But one could see Val's job, which is very much a science, as attempting to lessen the blow, or even just give someone a unique experience in their otherwise mundane day. The very first Malort infusion, if I'm not mistaken, was candy cane Malort, followed by people saying, what are you going to do for Patty's Day? Well, the Nisei way is, okay, you want green Malort? Well, guess what? Here's green in the form of sport peppers, because sport peppers, if anybody's ever had a Chicago dog, essential. And they're green. So there's your green Malort. Val says throughout the years, all Nisei's bartenders have contributed to making the madness that is Malort infusions. But Val has ascended through the ranks to present more cohesiveness and consistency. Here's Val and WBBM's managing editor of podcasts, Lizzie Baumgartner, talking about some of the key points. I only put a little teeny, teeny bit of habanero peppers in with the mango. Otherwise, it's way too intense. And it literally was making people run to the bathrooms because it was too much. Oh my so gosh. So when I made the recipe, I put just slivers of it, but somebody else put in giant chunks and people were crying at the bar. So that's part of the reason why the owners tasked me with just very focused. Right. Yeah. Like, don't let anybody do it. You are going to be the maven of everything. Yeah, the maven of the Lord Infusions. I love that. So in Chicago, Val has helped build up a cult following around what can be done with Malort, if not thrown down straight up. But Malort isn't like vodka or whiskey or a hard seltzer where it's more of an easy sell or confidently paired with something. It takes real science to get it right. In fact, convincing someone to try Malort in the first place is a battle within itself. Malort is an unusual product to me, and it's got to be included in business textbooks somewhere, someday, if it isn't already. A commercial product that's marketed based on its repulsiveness. That's a very odd thing. I mean, try our product. It's horrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird, weird thing. David Hammond grew up in Rogers Park and for the last 20 years has covered food and reviewed restaurants for Chicago publications like the Tribune, Sun-Times, Reader, and more. His recent book, co-authored with fellow journalist Monica Eng, is titled Made in Chicago, stories behind 30 great hometown bites. That is what is most interesting to me, the cultures that created the foods uh, that we eat all around the world. How did they come about? What confluence of social forces or conquest <laughs> um, or immigration brought these foods about? The supposed unmarketability of Malort led David and I to try to come up with other food and drink that people have a history of turning up their nose at in droves. As you were talking about it, I was reminded of something I had in Iceland. It's called Hakarl which is Rotten Shark. Oh yeah, you heard that right. The ammonia-rich Icelandic holiday standard, Rotten Shark. Uh, it's advertised as shark cheese because when you open the container, the pieces in there are smaller than a, a die, a, a, one, a pair of dice. I mean, they're just really small because they don't expect you to eat a lot of it. You open it up and you get this blast of like Roquefort cheese. Um, and it's shark. It used, this has been around since Viking days where they would bury a shark and the, 
good bacteria and the bad bacteria would fight, um, and the good bacteria wins, <laughs> which also happens incidentally with some cheese. Um, like unpasteurized cheese has good bacteria and bad bacteria in it. At some point, theoretically, the good bacteria overcomes the bad bacteria, and so you can eat. But it is some vile stuff. Now, no one's marketing it as really cool, <laughs> like Malort or a hipster food. It is, however, a traditional food in Iceland, and people eat it on, only on special occasions. So I'm going to take it Rotten Shark isn't up your alley. David then told me there's another local touchstone that just comes right out and almost flaunts its abrasiveness. The mother-in-law. A mother-in-law is poppy seed bun, like you'd find on a Chicago hot dog, the corn roll tamale laid into it, chili on the top, uh, diced onions, sport peppers. So Anthony Bourdain had a mother-in-law the first on his first season of No Reservations when he came to Chicago. And he said it was uh, the evil stepbrother of the Chicago hot dog, uh, disturbing in design, yet strangely compelling. But most significantly, he said, it is perhaps the greatest, most uniquely Chicago food invention. And I got to say, I'm not 100 percent certain what he meant by that. But because it brings together the tamale, which is originally, of course, a Mexican food <laughs> with the Chicago hot dog, which is in uh, the United States, Chicago food, and puts them together into one uh, one snack. And in case you're wondering about the name, and people frequently are, the joke is, it too will give you indigestion. And what exactly do you wash down your mother-in-law with at, say, local establishment Fat Johnny's on the city's south side near 73rd and Western? Well, why not a suicide soda? It's kind of a lot that, hey, right. uh, you really need something to drink. And what they serve there are called suicides. They're, it's basically dealer's choice. Who's ever making the uh, mother-in-law or the hot dog or whatever you're ordering there simply runs the cup under a number of different sodas, root beer, strawberry, whatever, puts it all together. There you go. That's your, uh, no two are alike. Come to think of it, mother-in-laws and suicide sodas might actually be a cure for too much malort. But how did Malort come to Chicago in the first place? To get to the bottom of the bottle, I had to go to the top of the Malort dynasty. So what I bring to the table is I'm a, basically a, now a professional drinker. <laughs> <laughs> have, you up, have you updated your LinkedIn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to. No, my mom would be horrified. This is Tremaine Atkinson, and his title on LinkedIn is actually CEO and head distiller of CH Distillery, the proud modern-day owners of Jepson's Malort, located in Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood. Jepson's Malort is, uh, is very particularly uh, known in southern Sweden, where it comes from, as Besk. And I'm not really saying that with the proper Swedish accent, but sure. spelled B-E-S-K <laughs> with some you know umlaut or another over it. In the farm country of southern Sweden, wormwood, which is the principal ingredient, uh, grows really just abundantly, and um, people pick it out of their backyards and soak it in alcohol and drink it. And that's what Carl Jepsen, who is from southern Sweden, brought to Chicago when he came here. Although our research doesn't pinpoint a specific date, Jepsen came to Chicago, Andersonville to be specific, prior to Prohibition. He immigrated, became a cigar salesman, got married. His wife was a Chicago public school teacher, in fact. And he also made Malort in his basement. And so he just went, you know, sort of door to door uh, with this, you know, homemade concoction and, and sold it. And, um, and people were grateful, right? Because, you know, everybody was looking to get their hands on alcohol. And, and the, sort of the nudge, nudge, wink, wink of it was that it's medicine. It's a, it's a tonic, right? There's right. this classic, you know, the very long history of tonics being medicine before, you know, we had things like the FDA around and to actually prove things worked or not. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, and of course, you know, he did this openly uh, because there, there was a, you know, a specific exemption in the Volstead Act, you know, uh, to allow for alcohol to be used for medicinal purposes. So every now and then uh, some law enforcement of, of some type or another would would harass him and say, hey, you can't do this, this is illegal. 
And he'd say, no, it's, it's medicine here and pour them a shot and they would drink it and say, oh, well, you know, that's so awful. Nobody would drink that recreationally and continue on, <laughs> Mr. Jepson. This has to be medicine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. How about that? Law enforcement during Prohibition said this can't be alcohol. It's so bad, it's got to be medicine. The Volstead Act Tremaine mentioned defined a beverage as intoxicating if it contained any more than half of a percent of alcohol. And despite that, with its medicinal taste, Malort and Jepson seemingly got off scot-free. Now, Tremaine is not a native Chicagoan, but needless to say, he's been properly initiated. I moved to Chicago 25 years ago, um, and uh, of course, I had a buddy who was from here, and you know, one of the first nights I went out here, we were out late, ended up at a dive bar, could not tell you which one, and, um, and I got the classic, hey, let's, let's do a shot, and I, sure, okay, you know, what is it? Oh, you'll love it, and I did, I did the shot of Malort. And I, I gave this the classic reaction, like, you know, what, what the F just happened to me? Right. Um, and, and, you know, my buddy said, my buddy Tony said, oh, that was Malort. <laughs> Welcome to Chicago. <laughs> and I said, wow, huh, can we do another one? <laughs> I do remember that reaction. Yep. Believe it or not, for Tremaine, it was love at first gulp. And I love flavors and I love bitter things. So sure. it, it was right up my alley, but it was the surprise of it. Right. You know? And I think that's at the heart of pretty much everybody's first, you know, Malort shot is the surprise. Absolutely. You know, because nothing else tastes like it. So how do we get from Malort not just agreeing with Tremaine, but becoming a must have on his shelf and then to making it his living? He was a self described amateur brewer while living in San Francisco in the late 80s and early 90s and thought maybe one day, he'd do so professionally. About 10 years ago, after being in the corporate world for a long time and getting a little burned out on that whole deal, um, I had saved up enough money to be able to probably, you know, buy a little shack in Arizona and play bad golf um, or start a business. And I thought, okay, well, I'll start a distillery. So yeah, 10 years ago, I started CH Distillery here in Chicago. But that got me thinking, surely CH's first few tries at Malort, already off-putting in general, couldn't have been a home run. I asked Tremaine about those first few swigs and misses, as well as how they attempted to meet demand. Oh, I remember it vividly. Yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it was a great moment, and it was a terrible moment. Um, we, we, when we bought the company in the fall of 2018, um, we also bought an a inventory, you know, bottled inventory, and we you know, did the math and thought, okay, well, that should last us about five months. And as soon as it was announced that Malort was coming back to Chicago, everybody just started buying more and more. Um, so that five months turned into three months. And uh, we had to kind of like bang out a batch yeah. to make sure we didn't run out. And we did. And I think we had a little bit of palate fatigue because we were making batch, test batch after test batch. And finally, we were like, OK, that's it. We're done. Yeah. And we made a batch, and we invited over the top 20 um, or so uh, Malort accounts in the city. You know, all the bartenders came here. We all did a, the first shot of Chicago made Malort. And I looked around the group after we did it, and, and everybody was like, huh, that was kind of good. <laughs> that was the terrible, yes, right? right. Yeah. And they said, yeah, it probably needs to be a little worse. And really, I knew exactly what they meant by that. What I immediately realized is the batch that we made had just had a little bit too much sugar in it, and it was it was overwhelming the the wormwood. But the the great thing about it, and what was so heartening, was everybody d said that, and then they're like, "Well, let's do another one, and just keep working on it. You'll be fine." <laughs> so and that's the Chicago. You know, it, it kind of sums up the Chicago attitude in in many ways. The great thing about Chicago is we're you know, we're, we are to the point, you know, we're, we're, but we're also nice. You know, right. we're forgiving. Right. You know, what the heck? Prior to the Cubs winning it all in 2016, that's been the Chicago way. Don't worry, you'll get them next time. And CH has clearly been doing it right ever since, because according to Tremaine, the Malort business has been booming as of late. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm curious if part of the shock and awe of Malort is just all in the delivery method. Downing a shot of Malort is like storming the castle for some, like when you would plug your nose as a kid and dunk your head underwater and then shoot up for a huge gasp of air. 
So is there an argument to be made that Malort is actually more enjoyable if we take our time? Malort could be considered one of uh, a bigger class of spirits known as Amaros, which are generally anything that's a little bit sweet, a little bit herbal, and definitely bitter, uh, also known as digestives. They really show up in pretty much every culture that has food <laughs> because um, there is something really satisfying about having a big meal of some kind or maybe a, a really terrible meal that and having a chaser at the end, something that kind of settles your stomach. You know, a little sip is very satisfying. It's kind of like very rich ice cream. You can actually eat it slower because, or at least according to the French, anyth yeah. you know, anything rich, that's why their food is so rich, so that you, oh. you enjoy small bites slowly. Interesting. And so Malort, it was perfect for that. Wow. Um, yeah, so I think it's underappreciated as a potential um, part of French cuisine. Ah, okay. So more time with rich food means taking your time drinking a digestive, which means more conversation, which means more time being spent with those we love. I get it. Even though the majority of people down a shot of Malort quicker than a polar bear plunge into Lake Michigan in January, that feeling of being with others in that situation is absolutely part of the experience. And when people who love Malort couldn't be with others in recent years due to lockdown, they still stocked up. With bars closed or at purposefully low capacity, many went straight to liquor stores instead to keep Malort at home. And beyond Chicago, Malort is making a name for itself in other cities, too. It is really catching on in places outside of Illinois. And one of the things that we've done as a business is really expand the market for it. So when we bought the brand, it was three, three or four states, and now it's in 30. We've kind of taken the spaghetti against the wall, you know, let's throw it out there and see where it sticks. And um, the, our top markets outside of Illinois, or Wisconsin, of course, is, you know, they, they just, they, that's the best, that might be the best drinking state. Uh, then uh, Seattle, uh, mm. Denver, uh, are at New Orleans uh, are great markets for Malort. And, I, and actually, Nashville is a good town. So there, there seem to be a number of places where Chicagoans have kind of drifted to. Mm. And um, those, the, 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 Malort sort of just naturally goes with. It's when you move, you know, there's some things like in your, your junk drawer that you're like, I'm not really sure if I should throw that away. I might need it. That's <laughs> right. kind, of, kind of what Malort is. <laughs> That's a good analogy. A junk drawer, although not rigidly regional, certainly feels very Midwestern, doesn't it? Unpretentious, but utilitarian. Reliable, but never the center of attention. Not trying to be cool is cool. Stepping back, putting no pressure on the consumer, leaving them to find Malort for themselves. It's like the golden goose that every ad exec dreams for. Word of mouth. After the break, we'll get back with Marlene to see if she's thought of any ways to best market Malort. Stay tuned. I'm back on the horn with Marlene Sharp, a creative executive producer slash writer based in Los Angeles who has been given the Herculean task of finding Malort's best selling points. But first, I wanted to ask Marlene in her experience, what works in advertising alcohol in particular? Why and how do people become brand loyal? I think repetition, just being seen is very important. Sometimes people don't know why they've heard of a company or a product, but they just know that they've heard of it. It's almost like subliminal messaging. I think that's important. And then people like to be recognized for accomplishments or achievements. So if they've won an award or if they've reached some kind of sales milestone to get the word out there and have people admire them for some kind of prestige factor, that also seems to be good. And then also to be associated with the hip and cool factor of the moment, whatever's trending that seems to be key as well. Minding their P's and Q's in public, not, not causing trouble in the universe, not getting canceled is also <laughs> very important. You could argue that for most who try Malort, the only thing that's getting canceled is their palate. But what Tremaine and his team make does have that cool factor built in. So what else would help turn people onto this bitter beverage? Well, top of mind is, are there any celebrities who are into it? who are just, who just like it, who have tweeted about it or 
talked about it on a red carpet or have a funny story that they told on late night TV or something like that. Um, if you can find fans who are organically so and not just paid endorsers, that's that's great because maybe you can entice them with product and maybe the, all kinds of things are possible if, if somebody's already a fan. Whoa, again, Malort fits the bill because even some celebs are partaking in this dastardly drink. On a recent episode of Kelly Clarkson's talk show, her guest, actor Benjamin Levy Aguilar, from, fittingly enough, the NBC program Chicago PD, has her take a taste of Malort. And the reaction? Not even a flinch. Despite going from an unknown to a superstar before our eyes in 2002 on American Idol, Kelly Clarkson has always seemed genuine. So this endorsement, if you will, of swigging back Malort like it's mineral water sent social media ablaze back in February. So we have the celeb angle, we have the cool angle. For Marlene, what else would make Malort attractive to a consumer? The, the most interesting thing I think that you said is that most people only drink it once, but then in Chicago, it's being sold like gangbusters. So my inclination is that to emphasize the FOMO aspect of it and like you only live once, you only drink once, uh, like a bucket list kind of a thing. You need to do this thing before you die because it's, it's so phenomenal. Fear of missing out or better known as FOMO. It's a very real thing and a very real feeling. While Malort isn't high-end and sort of welcomes everyone to the table, there is a hint of exclusivity to it, just in the intimacy of a good friend introducing you to this liquor that you've potentially never heard of and may never even speak of after that night. I don't know why <laughs> you would put yourself through this because it's it sounds kind of painful and unpleasant. But yeah, I would say the aspect of other things that people do that might not necessarily feel good, but people do them just for the bragging rights. I guess the bragging rights, that would be key to this campaign. If there's one thing stronger than FOMO, it's the fear of being bested. And through our research here at WBBM, we came across, believe it or not, a genuine Malort ad, long before Tremaine took the reins at CH Distillery, that speaks directly to the braggart the person with swagger who swears they can drink anything and does. This is actual text from a print ad by our best calculations from the 40s or 50s, boasting Jepson's Malort as the, quote, two-fisted liquor. Jepson is a liquor so bold, rugged, brash, and rough, your first sip rudely warns, look out, here I come. Brusque and harsh, the liquor Jepson takes raw courage to down the first round, then dares you to order a second shot. No better date exists than today to accept the challenge of your first drink. For the braggart who stays the first few rounds, odds are he'll be Jepson's forever. So, I read that ad to Marlene, maybe without so much character, and to bring everything back to modern day, she had an addition to the what does Malort taste like question at the top of the episode. The taste of toxic masculinity. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> that do, could be the tagline. <laughs> I, I do love that. That's amazing. That's great. After all her brainstorming, much like Tremaine's thoughts about Malort being the junk drawer essential to your liquor cabinet, I think Marlene came around to Malort's cultural appeal. So some kind of a staple that you have in your, like a can of chicken soup or bam, or like your earthquake food or your hurricane food. or whatever. It's one of those essentials in your survival kit. For Chicagoans in particular, yes, maybe that warmth we experience as Malort goes down can help us survive the winter blues. And for as divisive as the taste of wormwood is, there's also a warmth you get from sharing that first moment with friends or family, whether it's your first time or its last call. So why has Chicago in particular embraced this bracing taste for so long? Here's Tremaine's take. Ballard is, is it's just Chicago, you know? It, fe it feels like Chicago. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you, you can't overanalyze it, it just, it, it fits us, you know? 
we're tough. We go through hard winters. We're not afraid to take a punch and keep on going. David sees it almost as a Chicago code, like a knowing nod to a pal or a stranger. And I think it's because, I think one, there's the gag, and I mean that in two ways, the, the gag angle from the Lord. But I think it's also because it's our thing. Uh, it's like not putting ketchup on a hot dog. I mean, Chicagoans rally around that particular flag. Um, I think because there's like a good feeling to be part of a tribe. <laughs> a tribe that likes Malort, hates ketchup, still calls Willis Tower the Sears Tower, and still calls a guaranteed rate field Comiskey. And when you're talking to somebody and they know what you're talking about when you say that, you've made a connection with that person. Are you dropping that for my dad? Oh, you're so sweet. Yeah, how's it going? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming out. And back at Nisei, those connections truly last. When Val couldn't do her science with Malort in person during the pandemic, her Nisei family, be they patrons or coworkers, kept their connections going, like many of us, online. And those bonds only strengthened when things got back to normal. Recently, her dad experienced a serious fall, and the bar's community rallied around her. When my dad broke his neck, immediately there was people reaching out to me. What do you need? Do you need food? Do you need groceries? Can we help? Is he in the hospital? Do you need a ride there? Everybody reaching out and like having Zoom chats together and doing Lord O'Clock, <laughs> like who I became like best friends, like super, super close with one of the people that invited me to Malort O'Clock and now they work here. One of my best friends on the planet that I would do anything for. And we became super close during the Pandamarama over Malort. It's just so, it's amazing the bonds that you can form over such a bitter liquor, but those bonds are oh so sweet. You know what I mean? This episode of Looped in Chicago was hosted by me, Jim Hankey, and produced and edited by myself and Lizzie Baumgartner, with additional audio recording by Anne-Marie Welser. Be sure to subscribe via the Odyssey app or wherever you get podcasts, and follow us on social media at WBBM Podcasts. We'll get you looped in again right here next week. See you then.